This is the Real Estate Shop, where each episode will bring you a top industry expert to share their current programs or projects that are making an impact in our communities today. Be sure to check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Welcome to the Real Estate Shop. In today's episode, we are blessed to have Ms. Eris Scales, Senior Vice President for Social Responsibility and Global Initiatives at NARI, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trust. For those who don't know, REITs are trillion-dollar investment vehicles within the real estate market. Eris, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, Steve. How are you? Good, good. So we took a look at your professional background, which, of course, is off the charts. Can you tell us about your background? Just lead us through your education years, starting uh, when you were getting out of college. Yeah, so I, I still chuckle because that was quite some time ago, and I'm trying to think back. I, you know, every time I say... I essentially came out of school over 20 years ago. It it really makes me think about how much I've become a seasoned professional. Uh, But I am, uh, I would say, a a communications junkie. So I majored in uh, mass communication at Clark Atlanta University, Uh, ended up with a degree in broadcast journalism from Kent State, and a master's in public administration with a focus on urban affairs and policies from Baruch College up in New York. And when I think about, you know, how I thought my career would go and where it is today, um, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, One of the things that I think works to my advantage is that I'm, you know, a tri-sector, I say, professional, having worked in the public sector, having worked in government, having worked in not-for-profit. And even though they're all different industries and different sectors, there were a lot of commonalities. And I think that communications background, having really um, dealing with community and dealing with a diverse group of uh, multi-sector leaders to to accomplish goals has played out well for me. Excellent. So what was your first professional job after after undergrad? (laughs) My first professional job after undergrad was actually not a a real job at all because, you know, listen, I got my quote unquote big break um, after kind of beating the pavement, doing a lot of internships and uh, on air reporting. Um, I was hired by CNN to be a videographer uh, and to move back uh to move back to Atlanta, Georgia. So at that time I was in Kent, Ohio. Um, and they extended an opportunity for me to move uh, back to Atlanta, Georgia. And I was so excited. My family was so excited. We're like, yes, baby girl has made it. Now I wasn't going to be on air, but the fact that I was going to be with CNN and getting my teeth cut in the industry there, uh, we were, we couldn't tell us nothing. Right. So I get back to Atlanta and AOL and time Warner merged. So this was 2000. And when they did that merger, they eliminated, I don't know, somewhere around 800 plus jobs, maybe more. But I'll tell you one of the jobs they eliminated, it was mine. Uh, so I'm like, mm. wait a minute, I'm supposed to be on my way to becoming mm. the next big, you know, Oprah, Barbara Walters or somebody. Uh, and so at that time I had a child, my baby was, um, I don't know, she wasn't even two. And I was terrified. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? And I met someone who said, well, have you thought about corporate communications? Have you thought about corporate marketing? Um, And I was like, no. And they said, well, (laughs) you can come here and probably make about $45,000 a year. Let me tell you what, $45,000 a year for someone who was, you know, early in their career back in that time coming out of communications plus bonuses, it sounded like a great come up. And I went into that role uh, with a company called CT Corporation. And CT Corporation was a global registered agent company. Um, And they offer essentially uh, comprehensive regulatory compliance and due diligence solutions for major companies around the world. Just saying that, right, kind of puts you to sleep. And so every day I would go in there like, oh my God, I am losing my soul. Um, but also what <laughs> happened, also what happened during that time is that I would have a lot of conversations with smaller companies and emerging uh, entrepreneurs who were trying to use the services of CT Corporation, but they could not afford the services of CT Corporation. And in having those conversations with them, I would hear a lot about the challenges that they were facing as entrepreneurs and as small businesses. And so one day I said, you know, 
I've been at this now for a few years. What I would really love to do is figure out a way to take my communications background, this passion that I have, and now this knowledge that I have of working with businesses on the compliance side and figure out how I can be more of a voice and a connector between like community, constituent services, and public policy. And so that's when I went and pursued my master's in public administration up in New York. Nice. Wow. And then how did you uh, get involved with the Walker's Legacy Foundation? Oh, Walker's Legacy. That was a nice little moment in time. Uh, I was very familiar with the founder of that organization. And I think it was really a unique moment because it was at the time where there was a lot of attention on Black, a lot of attention on women and a lot of attention on entrepreneurs, right? We were on the other side of George Floyd. We had a lot of major corporations and even uh, federal government making major commitments towards supporting uh, some of these marginalized populations. And, and the founder, she had an opportunity to go do something and she asked for me to essentially step in and, you know, handle her baby for her while she wouldn't handle some other things. And so it was great. Um, as I think about the work that I did at Walker's Legacy, it really was no different than the work I had been doing prior leading up to that when I was doing a presidential initiative, Promise Neighborhood under uh, President Barack Obama, or whether I was serving under, you know, these seven different mayors that I've been able to support um, across the country. It was really about how do you create systems? How do you create policies? How do you create opportunities to build these multi-sector partnerships to really address complex social and policy issues. And so when I think about my career and I think about what I've been doing and even what I'm doing today, that is the underlying theme is how do you connect solutions to things that are extremely complex, but require the input, the support um, and, 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 and really commitment of multiple sectors and multiple industries and multiple types of partners. Excellent. So you were pretty busy. I know, you, like you said, you, you did a lot of work for mayors. Uh, you went in for Walker Legacy. And then at some point, you decided to found uh, Able Vision, which is still active today. Tell us about Able Vision and what led you on the path towards entrepreneurship. I, I chuckle at that. I chuckle at many of these things. I just sit here and I've been reflecting like, oh my goodness, how did I end up here and how did I end up there? And I think like many people, you approach entrepreneurship from a couple of different lanes. Like either you are, you have this burning passion and desire to be an entrepreneur because you don't want to work for anybody, even though you work for everybody as an entrepreneur, you got to work for your clients. You are working for somebody. Or sometimes opportunities fall in your lap. And so when I think about Able Vision, it was twofold. It's like people kept coming to me for services. And when they would come to me, I'm going, well, I need to have a company so that I can capture what you all are going to pay me. And the other piece of that is that I really am fascinated by the kind of, you know, just like the grit and the functionality and the commitment and what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Those are like literally some of my most favorite people that I look up to and I admire. Uh, and so for me, it's like, I have a service, I have a network, I have a specialty. Um, I should go ahead and, and profit off of that. And so it's really been, uh, I would say a labor of love in 2020, 2021 was extremely focused, grinding, committed, doing so much work that kind of at some points had to turn down clients. And then in 2022, I came over um, to Nary, and we'll talk a bit about that later, and I had to step back a bit, right? And now I'm at a place where it's great because I have a, a wonderful cadence with uh, Nary. I have a wonderful team that works with me at Able Vision. You know, those lives are separate and I'm able to lean in even more uh, in different ways. And so with Able Vision, we really focus on a few key things. Um, at our core, it's about how do you take things that are purposeful, but also make them profitable? And how are we taking things that are mm -hmm. profitable and working with our clients to make them have purpose? Um, and so we do a lot right. of outreach and engagement to connect companies, uh, city governments, nonprofit organizations, to very targeted 
um, targeted markets and targeted populations. We focus primarily around women, women of color, um, emerging uh, entrepreneurs, um, also really working to go in and sit with leaders around how they develop out um, inclusive operations and strategic planning and evaluation and program development. Because oftentimes, uh, you know, in, in smaller companies and in smaller nonprofits, they may not have that in-house thought leader or that in-house strategist that they can work with. Um, so being able to offer those services and that support. And then most recently, what I'm excited about is beginning to offer more of a, a suite of curriculum and services around increasing capacity. Uh, so it was one thing for me to work with you to respond to RFPs or to respond to proposals for funding or to go after grants. It's another thing to help you put some systems in place and or resources that can make it a little more um, automated and systemized for you going forward. But, it, you know, we've had a good year. We've just in the last few years have helped organizations and companies raise, you know, nearly five million dollars, um, have worked on some great strategic plans. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of the work and, and looking forward to seeing what we can do next. That's an awesome story. Thank um, you. Put you together. Yeah. Uh, before we get into your your role, your current role at Nary, just for the benefit of the audience, do you mind talking about the industry reach, um, U.S. as well as globally? Yeah, this is to your massive is, is the right word. And I often share that, you know, I've been in economic development, community development, for now at this point, like we said, almost two decades, well, a, a, a close to two decades, and dealt with a lot of developers, negotiated a lot of deals and just everything in this space. And uh, prior to joining NARI, you know, I'll be honest, I hadn't even heard of a REIT. And now that I know what REITs are and what their intent was, I am absolutely fascinated and I drank the Kool-Aid every single day. Uh, so, you know, just a little bit of context, um, U.S. REITs were established in 1960 by Congress. And at the end of the day, the, the thought was that this was going to be a, a vehicle and an opportunity that would give uh, essentially all investors, especially what we call small investors, access to income producing real estate. So it's like a way to democratize real estate investment um, and they're regulated by the SEC. So it's it's. It's it's something that you can, uh, you know, when you're investing into, I don't want to say, you know, investing is always you're taking a risk, right? And there's always some level of feeling unnerved about putting your money into things. But this is an industry that's regulated. It's an industry that's been around for quite some time and continues to grow and scale. And so within the re, um, industry, there's 14 different sectors. And so when I tell people, that I essentially work and represent commercial real estate, they're like, oh, they immediately think about office. Oh, okay, right? Or people think about housing. Um, but there's so much more to REITs and to this industry than just office and housing. I mean, it's covering things from industrial, it's covering things like uh, self-storage and data centers, healthcare, lodging, uh, timber. <laughs> like it just goes on and on and on. And so what I think is so amazing about that is that it gives you an opportunity to figure out which of those sectors is most palatable for you, you know, kind of understanding what the returns and the growth um, is within those sectors and how that aligns with your investment and your growth uh, strategies for what you're trying to accomplish. But globally, I mean, trillions and trillions of dollars is represented. And NARI, which is an amazing organization, um, you know, represents, I think, close to 90%, if not more, uh, of that industry here in the United States. And so REITs themselves own over uh, $4 trillion in gross assets across the U.S., about trillion. Um, and public REITs have more than $2 trillion in assets. So it's a massive industry, and I think there's amazing opportunity to begin to further work with this industry to connect it to more diverse populations and communities and to get those communities connected to REITs. Wow, that's awesome. It's hard, kind of hard to get your head around trillions. It, it is, <laughs> right? Because we hear billion. Right. And, and I'm actually, blown away by that. Right. You actually put an S on that, trillions. So. <laughs> trillions, yes. Exactly. Yes. 
So, so you guys represent roughly 90% plus of the industry. What exactly role uh, does NARI do on behalf of uh, all these REITs? So NARI, you know, at its core is a trade association. We're a membership-based organization. And I think about it in these kind of following buckets that, you know, as such, we are advocates uh, for the industry and for our members. And so we do a lot of advocacy. We manage a lot of relationships and engagement um, with congressional members and politicians and even the public um, to be aware and to have accurate and timely information as it relates to, to the industry. Obviously, we're doing as much promotion um, as possible and, and making sure that we're highlighting the positive um, outputs and opportunities that the industry is advancing. We convene a lot. <laughs> and when we do our convenings, it's really with a purpose. The purpose is to educate and inform uh, our members. And so our convenings are, you know, uh, conferences throughout the year that are bringing thought leaders and educational information for our members. And we're producing research, right? And so we do a lot of research so that people are aware of the industry, that they can understand the industry, and more importantly, the way that this industry is performing um, to be able to debunk any kind of myths or misinformation that gets circulated. And 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 as of late, and, and I won't say, you know, in the last few years, um, we're doing a lot as it relates to making sure that we're advancing kind of this collective social uh, impact and social responsibility um, of the industry on behalf of the industry across various communities in the United States. And I would just add to that, um, you mentioned convening in conferences. Um, I don't want anybody to think that this is just a United States thing because it's global initiatives is attached to your title as well. Can you just briefly talk about some of the places um, that you've convened at on behalf of the organization? Yeah, um, that is a great point uh, because even though we are representing the United States, I mean, REITs and this regime are, you know, depending on which source you're looking at, uh, you know, are also established or represented in more, and I'll just say in more than 40 different countries around the world. And obviously, all of those um, markets are at different levels, right, um, in terms of sophistication, in terms of advancement, in terms of the number of REITs that they have, and even like their market cap and assets and their value. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's amazing to see countries like Kenya, countries like China, uh, Japan, um, parts of, uh, you know, really across Europe, um, the Asia Pacific, where somehow I just recently came back from Singapore, Canada. I mean, we could just go on and on and on about how other countries have also recognized the value that REITs bring and can bring to, to their economy. And something that I find very interesting is that, you know, in some of these more emerging markets, we will see um, how they're really leveraging REITs or they're looking at REITs as a way to help um, to further advance their economy through infrastructure. And so again, when I talk about REITs and the power and the reach of them, uh, it's so diverse and it really ranges. And so we have an alliance that we have been able to um, stand in partnership with, um, which consists of our counterparts. And when I say we being NAREIT, um, our counterparts from Asia Pacific, from Australia, Canada, Europe, Japan, and the United Kingdom, they formed what is called the Real Estate Equity Securitization Alliance. And at the end of the day, you know, their goal is to make sure that they are using their brain power, that they are using their infrastructure, that they're using their thought leadership, that they're using their resources to continue to support these other countries in terms of advancing their regimes as well. And so it's been very fascinating um, convening them twice a year. Uh, we were just recently in Singapore. Um, before that, I think we were in Paris or London. So each of these amazing associations steps up uh, twice a year to host and to bring together uh, these leaders to really have conversations around uh, complex uh, tax uh, issues and complex 
matters that they're trying to address from a legislative perspective, from a membership perspective, um, looking at things such as ESG, which is globally, um, you know, impacting companies and countries. So it's an amazing um, resource and an amazing alliance to see that power. If you don't mind, what will help the, re- uh, the listeners understand what your day-to-day is like? <laughs> I'm like, is that a trick question? Because <laughs> <laughs> there is no day-to-day. But Kermit, <laughs> I love that question so much. I'm serious. And One of the things that I've been trying to do more of, honestly, in the last um, month and a half, two months, is be a little more transparent and share more about the work that I'm doing. Steve was saying, I'm seeing you everywhere. And the reason I'm doing that is because, honestly, I've been asked by so many emerging professionals and even established professionals who either want to transition into more roles around social responsibility or who want to better understand what it's like to be a Black woman working in this industry. They want to understand and see more of like, what do you do? How do you do it? Um, And so for me, every day it's pretty different because the work that we're doing here at NARI in this vertical is relatively new. You know, we're building it and executing it at the same time, which for me works well, because if you look at my background, that's pretty much uh, a big history of doing that. And so I have a lot of meetings with um, potential partners, you know, working across all the different verticals here at NARI, our comms team, our memberships team, our meetings team, our public policy team, um, looking at where we have intersectionality to advance the work that's happening Um, I now have a portfolio of nine amazing national organizations that we just started to fund uh, in the last year. So, you know, interfacing with them and understanding uh, programs that they're trying to execute, how we can connect that back to our members, um, making sure that they're on track and feel supported. Um, So it's really, my job does on a day-to-day vary, but it's also consistent. (laughs) As I think about my days when I was in the public sector, you know, running agencies or being a political appointee, my goodness, it was like drinking out of a fire hose every five minutes. And here it's not a fire hose, but it is definitely uh, a drip (laughs) that comes on a consistent basis. And, you know, my job is to make sure I have the cups that catch it and release it. Excellent. So what I found amazing about your organization, and I think our listeners will as well, is its dedication to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So starting with the supplier level, tell us about the initiatives you all have that are diversifying the commercial real estate industry from the uh, supply chain level. One of the things that really attracted me to this role um, was when I was informed that you know, we were looking to establish essentially another alliance or consortium that would focus on connecting uh, women-owned and diverse-owned businesses to uh, our members. And, you know, we've already talked about the magnitude of this industry and just the different sectors that are represented. And so when you think about the procurement and the buying power uh, of these companies and them saying, We want to be uh, in a position to understand how we can better support, how we can better identify, how we can better onboard, how we can better procure with diverse vendors. I was I was all in. And so last year uh, we piloted because we wanted to make sure that we can under, you know, use a couple years, because this is brand new. This has never happened really across any other industry, and it certainly hasn't happened here. But how do we use this time to collect data, to beta test, to roll things out, and to really build the momentum and work out any kind of tweaks that we may have as it relates to making sure that diverse vendors are being uh, connected and that our, our, our members are ready to be able to expand these types of skills and services to bring into their their supply chain. And so what we launched is uh, a consortium called CREDS. uh, And that CREDS consortium is comprised of NAREIT, 
um, International Council of Shopping Centers, so ICSC. I know many of your listeners are familiar with them. Uh, MBA, which is the Mortgage Bankers Association, NAOP, um, the National Multifamily Housing Council, uh, the Real Estate Roundtable, and CRU, which is the Commercial Real Estate Women's Network. So when you think about these organizations all coming together, and, and that's like a common theme that I think is happening across the work that I do is that, and that we're doing here in at NARI is that it's about building collectives. You know, we can go out here independently, but if we can go out as a collective, we really feel that our reach and our impact um, is more sustainable and it's, it's going to be far more far far reaching right and so collectively what we are attempting to do is to create this blueprint that allows for our members to be able to have a single source right now we're using a company called supplier gateway which is a black owned company out of chicago um and they are being directed to that that platform to go in to identify different types of vendors, contractors, um, even looking to figure out how do we use that to, you know, possibly support joint ventures and other types of collaborations. Um, and so it's, it's, I'm excited, you know, right now we have about 20 companies who have made that commitment. Um, and these are 20 major companies who have um, amazing buying power. And so we're continuing to scale that and figure out what the next phase of that looks like. And so for any of your listeners uh, who obviously are suppliers, vendors, contractors, et cetera, the first thing mm -hmm. I would encourage them to do is to go to Supplier Gateway uh, and to register their companies on Supplier Gateway. It's free. It does not take a lot of time. And it's something that we're pushing and, and continuing to, to figure out how we, we leverage as a vehicle to support our members with bringing more diverse um, businesses into their supply chain. Do you have to be a member of NARI? No, you do. So that's the thing. So Supplier Gateway, which is the portal um, and or platform, whichever terminology one wants to use, is free and open to any body. <laughs> so you can literally go on there right now and register your company to be in that portal. And so what that means is, you know, let's say you're offering accounting services, or maybe you are, um, you know, a, a, a contractor, you do commercial contracting, whatever it is, we are asking our members who have signed up and subscribed, our members are paying a subscription. They go in and now they're trying to do a search. Okay, I need X, Y, and Z because they're, they've made a commitment to maybe put to market or to bid out a certain, um, you know, a, a certain set of services. And so we're saying, hey, let's all utilize supplier gateway to see how collectively, you know, we can begin to move the needle or shift this narrative um, and be able to bring in more diverse vendors. And so you do not have to be a member. You don't have to do anything to register your company on the supplier gateway. Okay, that's pretty neat. And that's just, you know, uh, I mean, and that's just a, a part of it, right? And so, because certainly what I say is great, we can have a gazillion companies <laughs> in that portal but we also understand the importance of making sure that the companies who are in these portals, you know, next up is like, how do we continue to increase their capacity? How do we continue to foster trust and connectivity between, you know, our, our members procurement teams and, and companies that they haven't necessarily ever done business with before? So it doesn't seem like we're, you know, as through this pilot, we're able to see what is working where we can continue to improve. Um, and it's also what I say is like one of many tactics to address this strategy. Um, and so even with Supplier Gateway and the work that we're doing as this CREDS consortium with all the organizations I just named, you know, we're also, we being Nayree through our foundation, making investments into nonprofit organizations 
that are working to increase the capacity of diverse vendors and creating opportunities to connect their, uh, you know, their constituents and their clients and the folks and the businesses that they serve also back to the industry. So we're taking, you know, uh, I think bold steps. We all know that these types of changes don't necessarily happen overnight. Um, it's going to be, I tell people this is marathon work, not sprint work, even though we would love for it to be a sprint. But right. at the end of the day, I just, I get so excited. Sometimes I get chills when I think about the actual magnitude of what we have before us when we think of think about these procurement and capital opportunities for diverse and women-owned, Black-owned, Brown-owned, whatever we want to call, right? Whatever terms we're using these days. But for those of us who have not traditionally had these opportunities to now begin to have these opportunities to create what I say is like generational wealth building, wealth changing um, business. And it seems like there's a feedback loop to talk to the vendors and say, hey, what's going on? Is it working? Where some of the roadblocks and you continue to make make the cycle better? That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually assessing now. You know, we're 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 conducting surveys with our members, we're setting up one-on-ones, we're having conversations. Um with the administrator, supplier gateway, we're sharing our feedback collectively um, as a consortium. And, and that's what I value because we could certainly just say, oh, we piloted this for a couple of years um, and here's what happened, here's what didn't happen. And we didn't make any attempt, right? To make it the best in class or to meet the, the goals that we initially set out with. Like everyone takes this extremely seriously. And even our members, they have given us a lot of feedback. And that is something that I continue to value is that we get, we have members who are vocal. <laughs> They are very vocal and uh, we see it as a responsibility to make sure that we respond to what they vocalize to us. And that's really how we ended up doing even this initiative and many of the initiatives that we are launching because they've shared with us uh, through this amazing council that I get to, to coordinate called our Dividends Through Diversity, Equity and Inclusion CEO Council. So this is almost 30 CEOs who run some of the largest REITs in the world. They convene a multiple multiple times a year and they say, hey, here's what the priorities are that we have in this space. Here are where we see opportunities and here's where we see gaps. And so, you know, pipeline development and recruiting young people into the field has been a big issue. I don't wanna say issue, but a, a big priority for them and making sure that they're retaining that talent, making sure that we can support them on their journey to diversify their supply chain among several other priorities. And so what you see, the work that I'm doing, the work that we're doing at NARI is really in direct response to what they have shared that they want additional support resources and opportunities around. Wow, that's pretty awesome. But you guys go beyond just the supply chain. You're also um, increasing diversity at the individual level as well. Do you have some, some programs at that level? You know, we we do and we don't. And I would say indirectly. And and I really, another question that I value, Steve, because when I think about the individual level, you know, I'm thinking about like individual um, investors who can, you know, start making those contributions uh, into, into REITs, which absolutely can happen. Um, and we have yet to, to really... I would say hunker down and hyper focus to that level, but indirectly through an individual level, we are, you know, to your point, supporting because of partners like Project Destin, um, partners like the U.S. Black Chamber, um, and or the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, any of the, I would say, nine grantees that we're funding through our grant program under this initiative certainly touch individuals, and so Today, just even, I got to spend the morning with Project Destin um, and some amazing, 20 amazing students that we are taking through a new program that they designed in partnership with us, which is a REIT bridge program. So it is really like a six-week immersion course 
for these young people who have an interest in careers within the re industry. And so they have curriculum that they go through, they have these classes, and then we're coupling that with mentors and speakers um, and site visits. And so today we were at JBG's uh, National Landing down in Virginia. JBG is a member of ours. Actually, their, their, their president and CEO, Matt Kelly, is the chair of our board. So that was phenomenal. They're one of the contributors and uh, donors to our Dividends Through Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion grant. So, you know, that is absolutely, I think, an individual impact. And I heard that three of those young people are actually going into jobs <laughs> when they graduate at REITs. And so that was like, wow, okay. I mean, again, when I say it's marathon work and I say to folks, every win for me, every bit of a chip at this big mountain that we're trying to break down is literally a win because those are three young people who would not have probably traditionally had opportunities to go into these roles, right? And so now they're going in, they're prepared, they're exposed, they're confident, um, and they don't necessarily look like and or possibly come from some of the same background or pedigree that we traditionally see within the industry. And so I think that that's progress day by day, you know, one person at a time, one business at a time. It's just, it's a lot. Now, I would definitely say so. Uh, you're right. There's the individual level level in terms of investors, but actually mm -hmm. having folks who want to start a career, you know, yeah. in these types of industry, that's absolute. Uh, like you say, even if it's a, a drip level, it's it's more drip than, level. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so no, ex excellent work. I know we touched on this a little bit, but how does what's someone have to do to become a member? <laughs> I tell people, if you want to become a member, the first thing you should do is send an email to member at nareet.com. Uh, we have an amazing membership team that's um, led and supported by a group that's been around for quite some time. That's one of the things I love about Nareet. You know, when I was coming here, uh, I was like, wow, folks have been here for you know, some years, and <laughs> but that's great because they know the ins and out of the industry. They know the ins and out of the organization and we're able to create uh, programming and resources um, in response to what our members need. But uh, we do have two different types of membership, right? We have our corporate membership, which is for uh, REITs and publicly traded real estate companies. So, you know, more of the, the, the large scale uh, companies. But then we also have individual level members. Uh, and those are really people who are, I would say, stakeholders um, who support the re industry or the commercial real estate industry. So a lot of, you know, within that space, we'll see various professionals um, from either consulting or uh, companies who individually want to join or other types of professional service companies and or people who have their own businesses and are looking for opportunities to further network and connect um, with industry leaders. And so that individual membership, I'm pretty certain is just under a thousand dollars for the year. But again, if people have questions or they have an interest in becoming a member, um, they should definitely reach out to member at nareit.com -E and they'll give them all the, the specifications. Nice. So you know, this position is taking you all over the world. And um, you know, like I said, I, I know you a little bit, so I've seen some of the places you've been to. Um, the question I have is, is how do you handle work-life balance? You know, I realize that's a relative term, but what does balance look like for you? <laughs> you know, oof, that is not work-life balance I love I like the terminology in theory but it's not one that I actually really use because when you think about balance in order to balance something that means you have to essentially give equal attention to multiple things and to me that is counterproductive to what it is that we're trying to achieve it's like we're trying to get to this place of feeling like zen and relaxed and 
Um, if I'm having to give as much time to work and as much time to my personal, it, I don't know, it just doesn't, it just seems like I'm giving, giving, giving. And so one of the things that I try to say to myself that I practice now is work-life boundaries. Um, and I, I really did have to learn that even coming into this role last year, the last year I gained like 22 pounds. People will say, oh my God, you know, you're traveling, you're, you're having all these meetings, you're doing X, Y, and Z, and they want to glamorize it. And I say all the time, I feel so fortunate and blessed to be in this role, but there, <laughs> there are some, some things that come with that, right? Like you're eating out a lot. You're mm -hmm. sitting on planes for a long time, which is impacting your circulation. You're, you know, I'm a, a fitness guru. My, my workout routines are disrupted. So it was really hard on my body. Uh, and there were things that I had to give up, but giving that up didn't give me balance. And so what I'm now doing is like, I literally have boundaries and I'm okay with that. I say no to many a things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm finding that when I'm saying no, I don't feel like I have to give to either or. It's just like, this is where I'm at right now. And I can give all of my time and attention to just sitting down and turning off, which is really not something I do, but you know, I aspire to do, but boundaries is a lot easier for me to manage than trying to have what some refer to as balance. What about the fear of missing out? Do you feel like you're missing out because you didn't go Never. to networking? Never. never. I never, ever, ever <laughs> feel like I'm missing out. There's no FOMO in me. And one of the things that's <laughs> very, I have to debunk this with people all the time. People think that I'm an extrovert. They think that I am external and I'm doing all these things and I'm everywhere. Nine times out of 10, Eris is at home. Like you might see a smidget of what I'm doing and it looks <laughs> like all the time I'm doing something. I am a homebody, an introvert. I never fear like I'm missing out. And one of the great things that I do value about this role and the leaders and in, in the team that I work with is that I, I don't feel like that, that, that pressure, like you feel when you're working. And I would just say for me, like in the political circuits that I was in, or some of the really brutal corporate environments that I was in, you know, here it's a, we, we do work hard, believe you me, but I do value that they value how we feel. Um, and, you know, sometimes my supervisor, she'll call out something and be like, you know, you can say no, Eris, or I need you to just sit down. Or I need you to slow down. And I'm like, okay. Even when I first came in, I had these big goals and I was laying out all these things I wanted to do. And our CEO, he was like, okay, you can spread that <laughs> out. And I was like, really? <laughs> because I'm so used to coming from environments where that was just not a thing. And so you did fear like if you weren't producing, even if you weren't really producing real outcomes or, <laughs> you know, or impact, you were always trying to do something. And so one of my favorite CEOs that I worked for, Andy Zopp at World Business Chicago, when she first came in, she said, I see a lot of activity, but no strategy. And I was like, ooh. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about, you know, FOMO in, in terms of the workplace, you do see places and there are cultures that will create that fear that you got to constantly, constantly be looking as though you're doing something for the sake of doing something, but you're not really having an impact. And so I, I value one being a person who never fears that I'm missing out on some social event or some activity. Um, and I value being in an organization that does not make you feel like if you're not just producing a lot of busy outputs, <laughs> right? Like you're not accomplishing something. So, so no, no FOMO over here. Okay. What, what's your networking, I don't know, approach as an introvert, right? Like how, how do you network and manage relationships? Yeah, I, I network differently now. Uh, than I did before. And I think that that has a lot to do with 
kind of where I am professionally and where I am even personally, right? What do I have? You know, I, I ask myself, it used to be one of the driving questions and people are saying like, why do you do something? And I think that's an important question to answer why. So you understand what's behind it. But I also really focus a lot on to what end. Um, and so when I say that, it's, you know, I don't want to say how much networking can one do, but it's like, how much networking can one do, right? <laughs> My goodness, I have, you know, a couple of girlfriends, it's like every other day, they are at some, some event, quote unquote, trying to network. And I'm like, you've been a professional for over 25 years. Like what is left, right? You are already at X level. What is left? What are you doing when mm -hmm. you're in those rooms? And so for me, when I'm networking, and I, I, I don't like to use this word because we can overuse it here in, in the States, but it really is with intentionality. Like I have to be there because there is really some value in terms of a potential contract or a new client or a new, you know, some, there has to be a, a direct tie back and not just to be there in hopes that I might meet or I might. And so I don't know that I just, those days are over. And I think too, in the past, I used to have a lot of responsibility that required me to do uh, a lot of events and activities because of the roles that I was in, particularly when I was in the, you know, working like in the mayor's office or running agencies and you had to always be somewhere. Um, so now it really is, it's just, a, I try to be a lot more thoughtful because I, I got to, you know, have those boundaries so I can have some energy <laughs> to do the things that, that I'm trying to do. Um, but I get it. I get yeah, it. You have to know. Yeah. And I was talking with a, a young lady recently who was telling me to, she's like, I go to all these different things, but nothing is coming out of it. And I said, but, but mm. what's your priority right now? Like, what are you trying to focus on? Because if your goal is to bring more rep, like you're trying to bring more money into your organization, then why are you spending your time going to events that are filled with a room that looks just like you with everyone who's doing what you do? You're not at the event where there's funders. You're not at an event where there's grant tours and donors. And she, you know, so again, it's like, you have to really think about why and what. And so, um, I always just encourage mm -hmm. folks to think about who they want to be in front of. Just yeah. to add to that, so what what organizations are you a part of now? Um, now that you are more mature in your career. Yeah, I am, you know, a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And even just <laughs> this past weekend, you know, it was such a a blessing. Um, we had our economic empowerment expo um, here in DC at Martha's table. And they said, Ares, would you come and kind of share your story for what you've done to, to build wealth <laughs> throughout, you know, uh, you know, your, your life story around building generational wealth and your commitment to kind of breaking these, you know, I, I say financial curses yeah. that can impact us. And can you talk about REITs and, you know, the work that you do? And of course, I'm happy to do that. And it was beautiful to see that room full of women um, absorbing that information and the amount of women who followed up. So anytime Delta asks me to show up, I'm going to show up. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the president and the chartering president for the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Uh, and so that works me like no other. <laughs> that works me to the <laughs> bone, okay? They have me all over the place um, trying to you know, advance the mission and, and make sure that the work that we're doing to advocate on behalf of women and girls here in the district. So I'm always going to show up for that. And so there's a common theme with me, really entrepreneurs and women, you know, I'm, I'm super passionate about, you know, giving back to women and supporting um, entrepreneurs. And so a lot of my civic support and my philanthropic personally um, support goes uh, within those buckets but other than that not much because I've said no to a lot of things and rolled off of a lot of boards I serve on the board for philanthropy DMV so we're an organization that wants to 
uh, not wants to, but aspires to to support uh, donors here in the DMV foundations, high net worth and um, institutional donors who are making investments into organizations looking to address a lot of the socioeconomic disparities that uh, we have here in the region. So that that's that's it in a nutshell. Well, all the stuff you do, you really don't have to go out and network, just the organizations and the events that you go to. It's almost uh, organic, I would think. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Um, and then uh, the other thing I would say that was probably beneficial to you, it's, it's a difference between networking and relationships. And mm -hmm. I know you've had some high powered jobs, you know, in the district and, you know, pol the political scene. So I always tell folks at the end of the day, you can network all you want, but That's it, right. it's a big difference between network and relationships. So Yeah. And that is, that for me is a lot more meaningful than, oh, I went and met 15 people at a surface level versus, you know, I was able to connect with one person. Even if I connect with one new person a month, I mean, that's 12 people a year. That's a lot <laughs> on top <laughs> of what you already have. Like, and right. then you got to cultivate that. I mean, it, 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 it takes a lot to properly network. And I have, I don't know, maybe 30 people a week. I'm not even exaggerating who reach out to me, um, wanting to speak or connect or talk. And sometimes I'm like, and I was like, well, what exactly do you think connect? And I, and I don't mean it in a nasty way, but it's like, what exactly are you expecting from this interaction with me? Like why you, because right. sometimes they haven't even done the research. They might just see a title or a name or an organization I'm affiliated with and make an assumption. Um, and so I'm really trying to save them time and energy because right. <laughs> you don't get in front of me and ask what <laughs> and say what so I hear you so uh, I would say just to kind of wrap up the question you, you mentioned talking uh, to young folks as part of what you do uh, but overall what advice would you give to current students or young professionals starting out in their careers you know if you had to start all over again um, and if you had to start all over again would you do anything different would I do anything differently? I, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and I can't think of what I would do differently because what I did was navigate the hand that I was dealt. And, you know, I knew what I knew. I had a lot going on as a child. My father passed away abruptly when I was 13 from a heart attack. And I was actually living with my father at the time. And so there was a lot that I was just carrying with me. I probably was not the most joyful, <laughs> brightest <laughs> uh, young person to be around. So to even have accomplished the things that I was able to accomplish is, oof, you know, nothing but the grace of God and some amazing counselors and an amazing mother who was very patient with me. Um, but I do think, you know, there were times where, I shrunk a little bit because it wasn't cool to be smart, you know, um, it wasn't cool to be the girl who was into things that the majority of my peers were not into. Like I've always, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a outlier, you know, I already talked about being a social, you know, like being socially awkward and an introvert. Uh, I really loved art and you know, I love poetry and writing. So some of those things just were kind of counter to what, you know, my peers were into. And so I, I definitely tried to to fit within those molds. And, and that's a little bit unfortunate. And so, you know, for young people who are starting out their careers, I think more than anything is not to compare themselves to others. That comparison is the thief of joy. Mm. That's what I tell folks. Comparison is the thief of joy. And more so than ever, uh, I think in this day and age, there's just so much through social media, which is all a lie, first of all, um, that makes you think that, oh, if I haven't hit 30 under 30, you know, I'm there, I'm I've lost out. Or it's like, what? Like 30 under 30 to like, wow, you're 30, <laughs> you're 28 and you're an expert. And I'm not saying you can't, right. but it's like, yo, you gotta put in some work. And so when you see those types of narratives being pushed, 
I think it it makes young people have a certain level of distortion. And so my thing is your lane is your lane and you have to be comfortable, literally comfortable walking in your lane because trust you me, half of what you see or half of what you think or what they say is now the new norm or the new standard, you know, in a few months, it's going to change. And so as my daughter told me when she was coming up on her sixth year or her four year degree, bless her, mm-hmm. she said, my race, my pace. I said, okay. And yeah. that really struck me though. I mean, it, it is your race and it is at your pace. And I think that's the biggest piece of advice that I would give them. And to lastly, have have high standards. You know, I I, I really like show up fully. Today, when I was out there with those young people from Cedric Bobo's program, Project Destin, I was blown away. I'm talking about the level of excellence, the high standards, the quality of the questions and just their presentation. I was, I couldn't, I'm like, you're in college? Get out of here. I I just hadn't seen that in quite some time. So kudos to him and kudos to them. Um, But, you know, you got to show up in a manner in which you really want to be received. And so I think when we see these young folks who come kind of lackadaisical um, or, you know, not really going a little bit above and beyond or hitting these high standards, and then they get frustrated because (laughs) they're not getting the kind of due diligence, you know, respect or opportunities that they think they deserve. I'm like, well, why do you think you deserve it? You just like, you turned in a document that was full of errors or you didn't even fully think through, you know, so have high standards, show up and uh, don't compare yourself to others. Yeah. And I, there's a, you probably didn't realize that you said another golden nugget that I really have to highlight it. I mean, you said you navigated the hand that you were dealt with. That's right. Yeah. yeah and I got to just, you know, for the sake of those out there, I want to highlight that because life comes at you fast and you really do have to, it's up to you to negotiate those, those choppy waters. You got to, yeah. ne- you got to, and, and have the grit and the desire if you, if you have it to, to really figure it out. And so some days I go, man, I should have figured this out you know, years ago, or I should have been, I should be at X again, right back to that comparison or just me being so hard on myself. And it's like, okay, well, who in your family had ever been exposed to some of the things that you're accomplishing or that you're experiencing now, right? You, you, you don't know what you don't know. And so that's another thing when we talk about networking and we, we talk about, you know, moving forward, do not be afraid to be around those who are in the spaces and places that you aspire, or at least you think you aspire to be, because the only way you're going to find out what's, you know, what works or what doesn't work or how you succeed or excel is by immersing yourself in those uncomfortable places. And so when you talk to me about networking, like Kervin, that's where I'm at these days. I'm in the places where I'm so uncomfortable, (laughs) rooms that I never thought I would be in. That's where I want to be, not the ones that are familiar and comfortable like I can do that I've done that now I need to be continuing to push myself and to elevate not just for me but for my daughter and my nieces and you know trying to be an example for other young ladies excellent well great well that's going to wrap us up with another episode of the real estate shop Aris thanks for stopping by and chopping it up with Kervin and I and uh, we will definitely look forward to dropping this and make sure make sure you get pushed out there all Uh, right further thank you I love it Another day at the shop, content they can't get anywhere else.